So hi everyone and welcome to this episode of the Psychology Book Club. Um, today we're going to be talking about a book called The Happiness Advantage, The Seven Principles of Positive Psychology That Fuel Success and Performance at Work by Sean Acor. Just to get started, I thought it would be great if we could all introduce ourselves and say hello. So first of all, I'm Hannah. I am the current host of the Psychology Book Club. I took over from Jake about a year and a bit ago now. Um, but I've been to pretty much all of the psychology book clubs and my interest is personal and professional. Um, psychology and reading these books and taking part in this book club has really helped my own personal growth and I've really welcomed the opportunity to read all the books that we've covered so far. And I'm also a coach, so it's very helpful for me professionally as well. Very interesting to read about all these different perspectives and add a few more ideas and tools to my toolbox too. Um, so yeah, that's me. <laughs> Jake, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Jake and I started the Psychology Book Club and I've also been to pretty much all of them. And it's interesting now, I think we've done sort of a really interesting range of different books now and I've always been interested in psychology, but this is, you know, I think we've we've covered quite a lot of different ground now so I'm, I'm really enjoying it and uh, still very much interested in psychology and I've been yeah uh, been enjoying reading along and look forward to talking about this one. Yeah, My name is Tom and I've been joining in the book club for quite a long time since nearly the beginning as well and um, yeah I've, I've really enjoyed um, dipping into all sorts of different psychology books. I've got a lot out of it in my life and, and this is one that I'm very excited about because there are so many mindsets that I can take from the book, uh, which is really effective. So it's one of our, um, I guess, less heavy books. Uh, there's a plenty of humor in it. So I was really excited to join this one. Cool. Well, that seems like a really good place to start um, with this book, which is as we, as we usually start these conversations with... Um, general first thoughts you know how overall what did you think of the book well i really uh, enjoyed this book i thought it was a, a very straightforward easy easy to read um very easy to absorb and most importantly very easy to use uh in my own life book you know compared to some more abstract ones this is really a book full of stuff that you can take on board and apply in your own life and we've done a few positive psychology books now we started off i think we did authentic happiness originally the, mm -hmm. the martin seligman book and i've read a couple of other um positive psychology books and the more i read of positive psychology the more i begin to appreciate the um practical usefulness of it basically uh, just in terms of you know helping me to uh, be happier and more productive and this book is just full of tips and tools to help you to really uh, both be happier but also use happiness to you know to, to, to gain more fulfillment and get more things done in your life and um, the, the book uh, has some limitations but overall I thought it was great and I, I really enjoyed it. I haven't finished it completely, but uh, I'm very nearly done and everything I've read so far is great. How about you, Tom? Well, I'm, on that note, I'm halfway through the book. And so I'm at like principle four or five. And um, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. In fact, this week I worked like triple time at work. I expected to be incredibly miserable. But thanks to, I think, reading this book, I was able to use several strategies that just really elevated my mood. So it's, it's already practically been very helpful for me. Um, so I've just been incredibly buoyant all week until getting ill, just today. Uh, apart from that, <laughs> so no, today's a bad example. But earlier in the week, I was just really, really happy, um, really proud, noticing the uh, the strat like coping strategies uh, of for happiness which he talks about in the book um so i've used some strategies uh, that have helped me but i've also taken to using other strategies which have been negative that he talks about as well so it's been quite revealing for me to give me a map of my 
applied happiness, if you like, uh, in my life. So maybe that sounds a bit abstract, but I've, I found it very useful. Mm, I think I know what you mean. And I've had a similar experience as well. I really, really enjoyed this book. I think it's actually, um, it's sort of one of, I think it's probably definitely in my top three books that we've read in the Psychology Book Club so far. Um, which I was quite surprised about because we did, as Jake said, we did um, the Martin Seligman book. Authentic Happiness. Authentic Happiness. It was a few years ago now. And I can't remember a huge amount about it, but I do remember that I didn't really like it that much at the time. Um, and I, I can't remember why. I just remember <laughs> not being very enamored with it. So I was interested in reading this book, which is why I, I chose it. And I had read um, a book called Happier, which is by Sean Aker's mentor, at Harvard, um, a guy called Tal Ben Shahar, and that was very interesting. So I thought this would be worth a spin, and actually, I was really, really pleasantly surprised. I wasn't really sure what to expect going into it. Um, like I said, didn't have a super positive experience, ironically, with positive psychology books that we've done before. Um, but this was a really lovely book, and there are several things in particular that I really liked about it. Um, just on a personal level. Uh, I, I quite liked his writing style. I found him, you know, sometimes when you read books by academics, it's hard to relate to some of the things that they're talking about. And in this book, Sean Aker talks a lot about, um, you know, big Fortune 500 companies he's worked with and so on and so forth, which are not situations that many of us can relate to. But at the same time, the real meat of what he is talking about is very relatable. And the, his writing style is, as Jake said, it's an easy book to read. Um, and also he's, his sense of humor is sort of very charming in some ways. He can be quite self-deprecating, um, but not in a OTT way, just in a very sort of likable way. That's just my personal opinion, but I, I really like the style that the book was written in because it sort of helped me feel, um, as a reader, like a lot of the stuff that he was talking about was more relatable to me, even though the context that he's coming from is academic at Harvard, who spent 12 years living there, and then also now someone who runs this very successful consultancy working with these big, big corporations. So I think he did a really, really good job of bridging the gap between the world that he's in and the world of that most of the people who are going to be reading this book are in, and making it very, very relatable to... Um, I guess average Joe or average Josephine. <laughs> On a more sort of content based level, I really appreciated the fact that he went into the science a lot behind why we think a lot of the things we think or why we have a lot of the mindsets that we have. And again, you know, very, um, explained it in very easy to understand terms that left you feeling like, yes, I understand the science behind this now. I understand why this is happening. Um, but also provided some really, really cool practical things that you can start doing in practical kind of exercises and suggestions that you can start using to shift your mindset more to the sort of positive, um, optimistic bent. Um, and ultimately, I just, I really like the message of the book. The, the book in a nutshell is about the fact that quite often we think that actions precede happiness and, uh, um, if we work hard and if we're productive, then we'll be happy. But the the whole point of the book is saying, no, if you're happy and being happy is within your control. And as he says, happiness is a work ethic. You know, if you are happy, then you will be productive and you will work harder and you will have more satisfaction and fulfillment, not only in work, but in your personal life as well. So I thought that was a really, really interesting perspective. Really like the way that he laid it out. And yeah, I overall really, really enjoyed the book. Can I just say something yeah. about what you said? Because I, I, I thought um, that was actually one of the most interesting things about the book that got me thinking so far, and I'm, I'm looking forward to reading the rest of it. But you know, happiness has always been something that gets written about as a goal and as an end state that you look to do other things ultimately to achieve, and that happiness is sort of like requires no justification because it's kind of the end state that you're going for and all the other things are supposed to get you towards happiness. And it was really interesting to think about happiness in the way that he writes about it in this book as being something more like a habit that you adopt in order or, or work at in order to facilitate other good things happening in your life too. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit like, I mean, 
I'm trying to think of a good analogy, but because he's describing happiness as being obviously an end in itself, but also it's a bit like hygiene or something. It's just like it's something that you you do in order f to be able to to get things done, to be productive, to achieve other things in your life, to to be efficacious in the world, and to actually you know fulfill your your goals in life and and your achievements in life. And that was super interesting for me to think about it in terms of. You know, it's important to be happy, not just because being happy is a pleasant experience in itself, but also because if you want to do anything with your life, then being happy is how it's going to happen. Because you're actually more creative, more capable, more able to see opportunities and have an open mind or something and, and so forth if you're happy. And completely the opposite case, if you're if you're in sort of fight or flight, then you're essentially stupider. Uh, you know, your brain's not even working as much uh, in that state than than if you're in a happy state. So that was super interesting for me. As a like uh, all of the the books full of loads and loads of useful tips and and so forth, which I really uh, have found helpful. But it's also kind of a just a mindset that I found mm -hmm. interesting that, to consider that happiness is something that you know I'm reflecting on it after reading this book. It's something that I want. Not just because I want to be happy, but also I want it because I I consider it to be, in a way, my responsibility to be happy in order to to live a good life, an effective mm -hmm. life. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It really does. And I know you haven't read the end of the book yet, but actually one of the points that he makes at the end of the book, uh, you know how we joke in this, this podcast that... Um, the last often chapter. With, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the the phenomenon of the last chapter, where quite often we, we read these books, and whatever the book is about, there is always a last chapter, which um, on some level says, okay, and now here's how you can save the world. And more often than not, um, these chapters are a little bit off the wall in the sense that they are sort of more of a vehicle for the author to express their own um, social, political views about life in the universe. And they can... I don't want to generalize, but quite often they're quite incongruous with the rest of the book. Um, however, one of the things I really appreciated about this book is that there is this last chapter. So he goes into talking about the ripple effect and about mirror neurons and how, you know, when we smile at someone, um, if we make eye contact with them and we smile at them, that is going to fire off mirror neurons in their brains and mirror neurons right next to motor neurons. And we all know what it's like to look at someone who's smiling, like a really big, genuine smile at us and try not to smile back. It's really, really hard. <laughs> you know, you've really got to will yourself to do it. I, I, for me, it's impossible. <laughs> so smiling is contagious. You know, he just explains this on a very basic level. He says the amygdala can read and identify an emotion in another person's face within 30 few milliseconds and just as quickly prime us to feel the same. Studies have shown that when three strangers meet in a room, the most emotionally expressive person transfer, transfers his or her mood to the others within just two minutes. And so this can work in a positive or a negative way. So his whole big concept for the last chapter is that if we are practicing these seven principles in our whole lives, this has a ripple effect. And studies have shown that our attitudes and behaviors don't only affect people that we interact with directly, but that each individual's influence actually appears to extend to people within three degrees. So in other words, for each individual, there's probably nearly a thousand people that you can directly and indirectly affect in a really positive way by practicing these principles ourselves and making ourselves happier and more successful. So I love that because it is in the vein of this whole, you know, now here's how we can save the world thing. But you know, usually when people write these chapters, um, a lot of the books that we've read talk about, you know, here's how we can use this in schools and in prisons and everything, which for us as lay people reading this is very abstract and very removed. But when I read this and I was like, oh, a thousand people. And yeah, I can totally see how that works. And it's not like I've got to go out and communicate these principles to a thousand people, but it feels a lot more within my control to actually make a difference. And I love that. I really, it just left me feeling really warm on the inside <laughs> knowing that and also really motivated to go out and do this. And so that's the point that he makes is that even though, you know, where we need to start is practicing these principles with ourselves. His point is that if we can practice all of these principles with ourselves, and he makes a point that the seven principles, which I'll read out in a second, they're not um, mutually exclusive. They're all interconnected mm. and they all work together. 
and influence each, each other. So if we can practice these seven principles ourselves, then we can potentially have a profoundly positive impact on a thousand people, which is, you know, if you think about life purpose, whatever else you're doing career wise, or, <laughs> you know, whatever else you're doing in your life, in terms of the meaning of life and having a sense of purpose and fulfillment in life, the idea that you can possibly impact a thousand people to me is just so cool. That yeah. that feels like it, you know, that I really love the idea of being able to do that. That's really nice. And I remember, I mean, for just by comparison, Martin Seligman's last final chapter went off into all sorts of stuff about, I don't know, why God is happiness and just stuff that was kind of if you're not religious, which didn't, we're not, yeah, you can't no, really it didn't really mean that, anything. But yeah. the the message I haven't even read it yet. But the message of what you're saying um, from this chapter is uh, just a really positive, uh, straightforward one. Yeah, I was again really wasn't quite sure what to expect, but really, really pleasantly surprised by this. Um, Tom, did you want to say something? Yeah, I find that tremendously inspiring. I, I thank you so much for sharing that with me because it puts the rest of the book in a lot of context. Um, yeah, I've been thinking, oh, you know, I can affect the people directly around me that I interact with. But then, you know, if you have a really positive interaction, people start saying to each other, hey, you know, Tom, that guy who, you know, he's really friendly and <laughs> he's always really happy. Well, I'm really interested in what he's doing. You know, they start talking about you mm -hmm. and maybe, uh, I mean, I'm just guessing, but maybe that's a part of it as well. Um, but I love how how practical this book is. Like the, it's full of really memorable analogies that you can use to, to remind yourself of what the principles are that you need to work on. And uh, so it's immensely practical. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to actually applying like these principles so that, that I've you know, previously not been applying. So, yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Awesome. Me too, actually. I've, I've already... Um, written down a couple of things and added them to my um, I have a, like a task manager that will give me that I can schedule tasks into to recur on like a weekly or monthly basis or whatever and I've already scheduled a couple of things like writing down one of the suggestions he makes which is a very well-known suggestion but still very very effective <clears throat> is making time at the end of each day to write down three things that you're grateful for um, with that day because the point that he makes is that you're training your brain to look for things then you're training your brain to look for things that um, uh, what's the word provoke feelings of gratitude and appreciation and positivity and optimism and because our brains can only hold so much information at once if we're focusing on those things then our brains automatically start you know kind of like an email spam filter start filtering out those little annoyances that are not so important but if we put our energy on them and if we place our, our attention our energy on them become you know loom very large in our minds yes and can i just say on that note um this week when i've been as i was reading that exact chapter uh the, the weather in here was absolutely terrible so i was bucketing <laughs> it down loads of people were arriving to work after me saying oh i got caught in the rain isn't it terrible and of course I felt sorry for them because they were all wet. But later the people were complaining about, you know, just looking at the clouds outside. I kind of did a double take. I looked at them and I didn't know what to say because my mindset was one of, I, I can't conceive of that being a negative thing right now. <laughs> like my brain just can't, that doesn't fit in my brain because what I'm processing is so positive. And I hope, I hope the rest of my life is going to be like that now that I've read this book. Yeah, I think it's it's funny that you mentioned that as an example because I, I actually had an experience like that earlier today where um, I think, I don't know, this is a joke that English people are just obsessed with the weather. I think that's true to a certain extent because it influences our lives so much. <laughs> but um, earlier today I went out to a cafe to finish reading this book and it started absolutely pouring it down all afternoon. I was waiting for it to stop, waiting for it to stop, and it didn't. So eventually I was like, oh, I've got to go home now because got to you know make dinner and do the book club and so I left and by the time I got home I was just I was freezing my shoes were soaked through my feet were totally numb my teeth were chattering my hands were numb and the last two winters Jake and I have gone somewhere warm and we've left England completely for six months and gone to Mexico or somewhere else equally as warm and we, we're not doing that this year for various reasons and I was like oh you know I I think that was a really bad plan. I'm really regretting this decision to stay here now because this is just terrible. <laughs> and I was in such a bad mood. And then I thought about this book and um, at one point he talks about something called counterfacts. 
I think. Uh, uh, no. Counterfactuals? I can't remember. The... Yeah, no, that's right. Counterfacts. Yeah. So, for example, if you he, he uses the example if, if you walk into a bank and there are 50 other people there going about the business and a robber comes in the bank and fires one shot. He's got a gun. He fires yeah. one bullet into the crowd. It hits you in the arm. Is that a fortunate situation or is that an unfortunate situation? And if a counterfact is if you compare it to something negative, like, um, well, you know, I, I'm comparing it to me walking into the bank and going about my business and getting some money, whatever I'm doing. If you're comparing it to that, then that's very unfortunate. That's your counterfact. But if you choose consciously a positive counterfact, like, man, like we all survived. Everyone got out of that bank alive. That's what a miracle. There were women and children there. They didn't get shot. It was just me. And I didn't get shot in my heart or my head. I got shot in my arm. That's so lucky. Um, then that's the strategy is picking a positive counterfact. And I've already found that immensely useful. Yeah, I had that experience where I realized that, oh, I'm just, I'm making such a big deal out of this. This is like a rainy afternoon and it's completely altered my mood, but it's just rain. You know, it's really not a big deal. And I was thinking about this whole thing to do with counterfacts and I realized actually, wow, I am really lucky that because we are staying here this winter, it might be the last winter I experienced for several years. And it was just such a huge transformation. And it immediately I felt so much better mood wise that my mood just lifted and funnily enough I also felt less cold I still felt cold but it wasn't this burning <laughs> really heavy kind of sensation that I felt before when I was just dwelling on how much it sucked and how rubbish it was so that was really I mean it's a really mundane example but I think the whole point of this book is that this is not just big concepts that you apply to your life once and that's it this is a daily practice that you can do and a point that he makes later on in the book so I'm not sure if you guys got to that point yet but a point that he makes is that in some ways the more mundane the events that you practice these principles with the better he actually one of the principles he talks about is something called the Zorro circle where you know you start with small goals so you start you know in this instance with small things that you would work with these principles on and then you you widen your circle and widen your circle and widen your circle to reach big goals or to address really big topics with these principles. So yeah, he makes the point that it is like a daily process and you can use these principles with pretty much anything. The book's about work, but actually one of the things I really liked about it was um, even though a lot of the examples he gives are examples of meetings and things that managers can do to um, buoy up their teams and improve team performance and to improve people's performance at work generally, is that all these principles, as he says, you know, you can take them and use them in your personal life to improve not only your work, but also your relationships, your quality of life in general. Just, just uh, that, I just wanted to say that that whole chapter on mindset that has the stuff on the counterfact sort of way of thinking of things, it really impressed upon me. I mean, he's basically, he's talking about positive, having a positive attitude and optimism and looking at finding the positive side of things. And that, and the effect that that can have and not just the effect in terms of it improving your happiness, but actually, you know, it can have physiological effects on, on how well you mm. hold up to disease and, and uh, how your immune system is doing and so forth. I thought that was super interesting. That was really compelling, actually. Yeah. yeah and, well. you know, it really gives you a lot of uh, it, 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 it leaves you feeling super motivated to damn well have a positive attitude you know <laughs> and really like i mean it's such a like I, I, it actually makes me feel quite intolerant of people who have a very downer attitude on mm -hmm. things because i know that that will bring me down if i'm not careful you know what i mean <laughs> that yeah. I, I actually it's like no i really want to be positive and optimistic and i really want that to be an important part of the way that i live and the way that my outlook is because i know how big effect that an effect that can have on my overall sense of well-being but also on how effective i am in my life you know yeah and interestingly in one of the later chapters he talks about how common sense is not necessarily common action he relates the story of one of the earlier talks that he gave at one of these big companies so i think when he just set up his consultancy it was all very new for him and he walks into this room and he's talking about happiness and someone pipes up and says well isn't everything that you're saying just common sense and he was flummoxed, but he felt really panicked. And he tried to engage this guy a little bit and then sort of moved on. And he said afterwards, he went out with a couple of the people who worked for this company. 
And they said, oh, you know that guy that said isn't this just common sense? We can't put him in teams with people anymore because he's one of the most negative people on the team and he just brings everybody down. Sean Aker said that's when he realized that we all know this stuff. You know, we all know it's common sense, but there's a difference between common sense and common action. And so another point that he really makes in the book is that even if you think, well, you know all of this stuff, you've got to Could really look it. at your life and think, okay, how am I applying this? How really, how diligently am I applying this in my life? And how conscious am I being of how I am showing up with other people, how I'm thinking in my own mind and so on and so forth? Before we continue, uh, for everyone listening that hasn't read the book, I'd just like to run through a brief overview of the seven principles, just to kind of give a framework for what we're talking about, because this is how the book is structured. He breaks it up into these seven principles. And like I mentioned earlier, as he says at the end of the book, these are not mutually exclusive principles. They're all interconnected. They all work together. They all enhance each other. So principle number one is the happiness advantage. And this is the idea that positive brains have an advantage over negative or neutral brains. We can retrain our brains to capitalize on positivity and to improve our productivity or performance. Principle number two is the fulcrum and the lever. So how we experience the world and our ability to succeed with it changes based on our mindset, as we've just been talking about. So adjusting our mindset, which is the fulcrum, gives us the power to be more fulfilled and successful. So our power is like the lever. So if we move the fulcrum, we adjust the amount of power. Principle number three is the Tetris effect. This is called the Tetris effect because uh, scientists did a study where they made people play Tetris for a long time and then realized that when people were going out into the normal world, they were seeing life as a Tetris game. So they were looking at buildings and thinking, well, if that was just tipped on its side and moved to the right slightly, they would, you know, (laughs) fit together. (laughs) So this is called the Tetris effect now. And this is the idea that when our brains get stuck in a pattern that focuses on stress, negativity, and failure, we set ourselves up to fail. But we can retrain our brains to spot patterns of possibility and opportunity. Um, so one of the examples that he gives in the book of this is that he, when he was at Harvard, apparently he spent a lot of time playing a game called Grand Theft Auto, which is about stealing cars and I think performing tasks for drug lords and stuff like that. <laughs> and he said he left uh, his college dorms one morning after a very heavy night of playing this game and he'd been playing it five hours straight the night before and he saw a police car outside And he was almost tempted to steal the police car because he had been playing this game for so long. And that's what you do in the game. (laughs) But luckily, his conscious brain kicked in just before he did it. But that's an example of the Tetris effect. And uh, I'm not sure we've all tried to steal police cars, but I think we can all relate to that on some level. The fourth principle is for falling up. This is the idea that in stress or crisis, our brains map different paths to help us cope. This is about finding the mental path that not only leads us up out of failure or suffering, but teaches us to be happier and more successful because of it. So he says that there are three paths that we can take in general when we are in a crisis. So the first mental path is the path that brings us back to where we were before the crisis happened. So we're no worse off, we're no better off, we just are back where we started. The second path takes us to an eventuality where we are worse off. And it's a complete disaster. And he says, usually we think of crises in terms of those two outcomes. So either that we're back to where we started before the crisis happened, or we're worse off afterwards. And he says there's actually a a third mental path, which he calls falling up. I think this is the chapter where he talks about post-traumatic growth as well. And how, you know, actually for some people, if you're in the right mindset, you know, real calamities and traumatic situations, although they're terrible and harrowing, they can actually be an opportunity for growth for some people. Principle number five is the Zorro circle. So um, I mentioned that earlier. It's this idea that when we feel overwhelmed, our rational brain can get hijacked by our emotions. This principle teaches us how to regain control by focusing first on small manageable goals, then expanding our circle to achieve bigger and bigger ones, which gives us back that feeling of control. Uh, Principle number six is the 20 second rule. This is based on the idea that our willpower is limited. When it fails, we fall back to the path of least resistance, uh, which is usually the habit that we're trying to break or the thing that we're trying to stop doing. (laughs) 
And by making small energy adjustments, we can reroute the path of least resistance and replace bad habits with good habits. So the 20 second rule basically means that if you are trying to implement a good habit, set your life up so that you are making that habit the path of least resistance. And equally, if there are things that we want to stop doing, things that aren't so great for us, we can make it harder for ourselves to do those things by introducing that extra 20 seconds. So then principle number seven is social investment. This is actually the chapter that I found most interesting. I thought it was a really interesting and unique take compared to some of the other books we've read on this. This is the idea that in the middle of a challenge, some people choose to hunker down and retreat within themselves. I think this is why I found it interesting because that's totally what I do. (laughs) Um, And he says the most successful people invest in friends, peers and family members. Social support network is one one of the greatest predictors of success and excellence. So those are the the seven principles. If you haven't read the book yet and you're thinking about it, they're all really, really worth reading about. And I'm sure, I don't know about you guys, Jake and Tom, but there were definitely certain principles that resonated more with me where some principles, I feel like I'm kind of doing them naturally anyway. And other principles, I was realizing, oh, actually, I'm really not helping myself in that regard. You know, I'm really, I could definitely make a few changes. Yeah, I really appreciate that, um, that overview um, and thanks so much for filling me in. I'm really excited to learn about those three last principles in the book that I've not covered yet. And you're right. Like I, I find um, there, there are some principles I'm already quite good at. Like I'm reading the Zorro Circle at the moment, um, which is about you know, as you said, you know, having this this internal locus of control. That's what the way he calls it. And I believe that's the way it's referred to in psychology in other books as well. And uh, yeah, I, I believe I've, I've always had this core belief within me that, you know, um, my, my happiness is within my control. Or if I'm not good at something, then if I, if I think about it and I spend time on it and I practice, I will be able to achieve mastery of this problem. Um, and so I guess the, the means by which you do that is by starting small and growing bigger. That's something I'd, I'd be interested to start applying rather than trying to bite off more than I could chew um, and feeling overwhelmed. Um, so that's, that's one that's, uh, that I guess I'm quite ambivalent about. And so that kind of stuck out for me. Um, but I, I've definitely experienced using the 20 second rule um, uh, thanks to yeah it's, it's a very useful thing like leaving my violin out means that I'll pick it up and practice and when I was learning violin that's really useful now that I'm trying to be a writer rather than a violin player that's the worst thing I can do so I have to put it in its case and put it underneath a pile of cushions like in another room so that it's very hard for me to get it out um, and conversely you know put my computer where it needs to be, uh, you know, have it charged, have it, uh, and make myself ready to write. So, so that's a really interesting thing I'm going to be applying. I hadn't thought about the, the negative side of it, like using it to your advantage. That's, that's really sneaky. How about you, Jake? Were there any principles in particular that stuck out to you as sort of being personally relevant? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting um, hearing you go through them because uh, I know that some of them are more familiar to me because they're actually they're in other books on mm-hmm. positive psychology too. So some of them I feel like I really have got a lot out of and others I noticed were were definitely things that I have a challenge with. So, for example, the happiness advantage, the idea that um, of kind of, you know, having a uh, positive brains having an advantage and, and you can do things to encourage your own positivity. And the, the, a lot of the exercises that he talks about are in Sonia, Sonia Lebomirsky's book and they're also in the um, the book by Martin Seligan as well on, on happiness. And I've been doing some of the positive psychology exercises for about... Uh, four years now actually um so i've been doing a gratitude journal and i've also been doing acts of the acts of kindness and mm-hmm. I, I i have like you i use reminders in my t- in my task list to to kind of make sure i do it i found the gratitude journal to be just awesome it just really really positive and has a huge impact on my mindset and in general i think has has really helped me to kind of exercise my own uh, positive outlook, basically. So I found that really good. The acts of kindness is something that 
is I think really really good and I also find it hard I try and do one act of kindness every day just mm -hmm. like and he makes the point in the book you can't just decide oh yeah that was a nice thing I did you got in to, retrospect in retrospect <laughs> you've got to consciously decide yeah. I'm going to go and do this which I hadn't yet you know hadn't yet just done or whatever and you know it, it's interesting because it, it forces you to to look for opportunities to uh to be a good person and to do good things for other people and just to find opportunities like that in life i think is it's interesting because it changes your outlook um and i still find it hard i still find it hard to, like sometimes i think what am i going to do today you know what could i do that would be like I don't know. Sometimes you don't want to just do the same thing over and over again, and so forth. So, anyway, that that's really interesting. Those exercises, I've I've found them really good and really helpful. I've been doing them for a while. The chapter on the, the Tetris effect is interesting for me because I totally have that issue. And he points out that some professions, in particular, ones that um, focus on critical thinking, like lawyers and um, accountants who are looking at tax returns, who are looking for mistakes and stuff, he makes the point that those people often become quite depressed because they they have mm. a very critical attitude that carries they're used to looking for mistakes they're looking for mistakes yeah. right and they have a critical attitude and it carries over into their whole life i totally had that and i totally experienced that you've actually pointed this out to me before <laughs> that i tend to find problems um and i noticed this because my brain looks for problems i mean i, I like i've got the tetris effect where i can look at anything any situation or whatever and look for what are the issues that could go wrong or what are the problems here or what needs changing or what needs improving? And that, you know, can be very helpful, but it also is something that if you're not conscious of it, you're not careful, then you just spend your whole life looking for bloody problems. <laughs> I think that's the thing, though, is that he points out that it is a very human thing to do. You know, we are naturally problem solvers mm. and we gravitate towards solving problems because if you think about our ancestors... They had to solve problems in order to survive. And know? we still need to solve problems too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not so much a matter of life and death for us anymore, but we are still wired to do that. And yeah, if we want to live um, secure, fulfilling lives, we need to solve problems. But the point, so the point that he makes is it's not about eradicating that completely, which I think is what you're saying. It's just about getting a balance and making sure that your complete perspective of the world is not biased completely towards the negative. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it's actually a question of just looking and being conscious and, f and being aware of the positive things that you can encourage as well as the problems. I, I know that, for example, this is something that I really didn't understand when I was employing people. And I didn't, I, I did, I did try and encourage people, but reading this book, I realized just how much more positive and how much more fun and how much more uh, enjoyable the experience of working with me could have been if I had understood some of these principles a bit better. And that, I think, is really helpful mm -hmm. to, to, to really understand. He makes the point um, that this is something that I didn't do, but something that I really understood viscerally when he mentioned it. He mentioned, like, a situation where an employer said to um, someone, okay, you know, you're doing this presentation next to this PowerPoint and, you know, make it, make it count, buddy, because the, the business depends on this. It's really, you know, this is all or nothing, you know. And he makes the point, this put the guy who was about to do a presentation on, under such psychological pressure that he spent the next couple of hours going over and over and thinking of all the things that could go wrong and totally got him into the wrong mindset, right? Because the, the guy who was employing with him, employing him didn't give him the message like i believe that you can do it and i'm you know go for it i'm i'm looking forward to it i'm going to enjoy it and like that's something that i was aware enough not to to be that bad a boss to say that kind of thing but it's something that i found really interesting to in the book because it really it stuck home it really sort of uh, struck home for me the message of like how your own mindset about what your expectations of someone else are and what your looking f uh, what your evaluation of them is can actually be a self-fulfilling prophecy of how that person is that you know you it does you have a responsibility to bring out the best in all the other people in your life mm. by seeing the best in them and that doesn't mean 
not seeing problems because I do still I, I'm very very grateful for my critical mind and for my ability to think critically and for my ability to solve problems I'm very grateful for that and it's very helpful in my life but the point is I also consider it a responsibility for me to see the opportunity the, the potential in people and in situations and in in everything in my life and that if I fail to do that then I am actually having a negative impact not only on my own happiness and well-being, but on those on the happiness and well-being of other people in my life. Thanks for sharing. Mm. He makes he makes the point in the book that you know obviously the benefit of seeing problems is that you see the threats and you can potentially respond to them, and we need to be able to do that, right? But the benefit of a positive outlook is that you see opportunities. Mm -hmm. And he makes the point, and he gives lots of examples of. Uh, social uh, so, social psychology experiments I won't bother going into the details but they all basically show that with a positive outlook you actually see opportunities that people who have a pessimistic outlook just miss they just don't even see the opportunities at all and so that's sort of one of the real powerful benefits of, of being optimistic and being happy is that it opens your your awareness up to opportunities that you in your environment and your life for good things to happen that otherwise if you're in a really negative state of mind you're just going to miss yeah absolutely and he makes a point i think it's in one of the first chapters that um numerous studies have shown that our external circumstances only predict about 10 percent of our total happiness so later on in the book he talks about um and these are really famous studies, but people who've done studies on our baseline of happiness and how our baseline of happiness doesn't actually really change that much. And even if you go through a really catastrophic event, like you're in a car accident and you end up paralyzed, you know, when they've studied people like that who've had these drastic life changes as a result of terrible mishaps or misfortunes that have come across them, actually, after a couple of months, their happiness has returned to, you know, fairly much back to what it was before. Although I understand from what he's saying that by that baseline, what, what he's saying is that your baseline doesn't change relative to external circumstances, exactly, but, but you, you can, can change your own, yeah. you can change it based on your own attitude and your own habits and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. And he talks about things like um, learned helplessness and learned optimism as well. Mm. Um, I don't think he uses quite those phrases, but he definitely talks about helplessness and how if we're focusing on, you know, if we're using the Tetris effect to focus on the negative, like you were saying, it's basically our, our minds are like that email spam filter that I mentioned earlier. And as you were saying, you know, if we if we have that spam filter set on negative, we end up letting all the negative uh, messages into our mind's inbox and we end up filtering out all the positives to the extent where we don't even see them. You know, mm. they just get rooted into a completely different um message box and we don't even know that they're there so I, th I thought that yeah. was really interesting and it also made me think like oh okay because I know that I can definitely get stuck in quite a negative mindset sometimes and it actually left me feeling kind of excited reading that and thinking like wow I wonder what what opportunities are going to open up to me yeah. as a result of practicing this in my daily life mm. yeah on that note I just wanted to say like I'm really looking forward to seeing how um uh, how I'm going to become more of, <laughs> I'd like to think, more of an authority on happiness. Um, because I, I've been through depression. Uh, with the aid of therapy, I got out of that depression. And with the aid of reading about psychology and journaling. And I've studied depression for a long time, like years. And I've got a very good understanding of it. So when I picked up this book and, he's, uh, and he starts talking about what positive psychology is, saying, you know, and there's a great quote in, uh, near the start of the book it says, if we study merely what is average, we will remain merely average. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, positive psychology is about focusing on the, the tip of the, of the curve or the, the outliers where people are happy and we can't work out why, but we should study those people because they're really doing it right. And I, you know, reading this book, um, uh, when he defines happiness, I've, I feel like I've got much a much better understanding of what happiness is constructed from. So he lists ten different emotions of like joy and fulfilment and uh, you know this kind of thing. And so I feel um, 
very optimistic. <laughs> I'm looking forward to uh, exploring, um, you know, how I can use the happiness advantage rather than just merely uh, trying to come back up to average because I've been depressed. You know, so yeah. so really, really, imp- I find the book really empowering. So I really love it. For sure. And I think he actually says at the beginning of the book that, you know, in physical medicine and in, in, in terms of physical health and medicine and in terms of emotional health and psychology, you know, as a culture, we place a lot of emphasis on studying pathology and studying things that are wrong and studying illness. And he makes the point that we know so much about illness and we, so, we know so much about what's wrong. Um, but we hardly spend any time studying, comparatively, any time studying what's right, you know, what is healthy, not only what is going to cure our ailments, but what is really going to optimize our health. And yeah, like, like you said, Tom, I love that graph that he showed at the beginning and how a lot of times in science, they'll write off the outliers in studies as anomalies, but actually positive psychology is about studying those outliers and working out what it is that they're doing differently from people who are, quote, the norm. So I guess anything that for you guys that you weren't such a huge fan of in this book? Actually, I don't really have any uh, major criticism of the book because one of the things about this book is that it's very limited in what he's, he's trying to achieve. You know, he basically, the book is to convey some of the findings from positive psychology and to show how you can use them. And he doesn't try and do, in a way, he's got a more limited aim than Martin Seligman's book, Authentic Happiness, because Martin Seligman gives a bit of his, like, I don't know, philosophy of the world and wider thoughts of Martin Seligman in his book. Like I said, he talks about God in the last chapter and how he thinks happiness is related to God and all this kind of... And this book is very much more practical. The Happiness Advantage is just a practical uh, sort of summary of things that you can usefully use from positive psychology. And on that basis, you know, I think it's great. I don't really have any... I don't really have any sort of anything in there that I objected to or whatever. I found it very helpful. Yeah, same same here. I can't floor the book. Maybe I've been primed to view it with a positive Tetris effect. <laughs> so maybe that's all part of his strategy. Yeah. 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 Using the positive Tetris effect, you will have no criticisms. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, we've totally yeah. switched off our critical faculties now. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, I was thinking, like I said, the, the focus is very much on work. And it was actually really... I, part of the reason I chose it is... Um, it wasn't intentional <laughs> that it, initially that it was focused on work. I thought it was a general positive psychology book, and I didn't actually realise because uh, I didn't read the subtitle properly that it was um, geared more towards work. But actually, I feel like that's quite a nice fit for this book club because I don't think we've ever really done a book that is specifically geared towards work before, and how people can you know we spend most of our waking lives at work. I see this as far more useful than just at work, though, as well. Yeah, but that was that was what I was going to say. Is that um, while I was reading it, I was thinking a lot about um, work, particularly because I'm I'm self-employed, and there's a lot of challenges, you know, that come with being self-employed. Um, there's a lot of challenges that you you get being employed in one of the corporations that he's talking about that don't necessarily come when you're self-employed. But there's a lot of very very similar challenges experienced in different contexts, and so. It was super, super helpful thinking about how I approach life generally in my personal life and just the attitude, uh, the attitudes that I have towards life in general, whatever situation you're in. One of the great things about this book is that there really is something for everybody. And we rarely say that (laughs) about, I think it's very, very rare that we we come to these book clubs and we have, you know, we're, we're quite a... Are you, as you were saying earlier, you know, we are quite a critical, <laughs> we can be quite a critical bunch sometimes, but we, we are quite honest about our feedback. And um, we will say if there's stuff that we that we didn't like about specific books. Um, yes, yeah, so it's very rare that there are no real criticisms that we have about a book. But I think that's testament to the fact that this book is very simple, but very practical, very empowering, as you said, Tom, very, very applicable to anybody's lives you know whether you're using it to improve your work life your personal life or a little bit of both like me but yeah I don't really have a huge amount more to say about it there's actually 
a quote that I would like to finish up on before asking you guys if you have anything that you would like to to finish up with just because I think this really sums up what we've been talking about and also what the book is about in general so this is a quote that he actually that Sean Aker actually uses in the book which is from Jim Collins and this quote says we are not imprisoned by our circumstances our setbacks our history our mistakes or even staggering defeats along the way we are freed by our choices I think it's an awesome quote so yeah Jake did you have any final thoughts no, not really. Just uh, I've enjoyed chatting about it and I very much look forward to practically putting more of the uh, suggestions and tips in this book into practice. And as for me, um, I've, I've noticed that very, very recently I've been investing more in really key friends that are helping me with projects I'm working on. And so having not got to that last that chapter about investing in your social circle or something i'm i'm really looking forward to you know plowing through the rest of this book so i can get to that and really like capitalize on on that trend that i've noticed is really really helping me um so yeah yeah that's all my thoughts awesome well um as you might have noticed i haven't quite got my act together to put up the next book club yet but we will be doing a book on willpower uh, which I will be posting very shortly. Um, Jake, who wrote that book? Is you the one that recommended it? Baumeister. Baumeister. Yeah, I've forgotten what his first name is, but Baumeister is his name. Okay, so Willpower by someone by Ma- Baumeister. <laughs> um, but if you would like to take part in that, if you're interested in learning more about Willpower, you can go to the Psychology Book Club Facebook page and it will be on there. And that will be happening in early November. So thanks a lot for joining us today, Tom and Jake. (laughs) I was going to say everyone, but there's only two of you, so I thought I'd name you both. Thanks, Tom. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, really enjoyed the call. It was a great chat. Okay, thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.